It's time to begin. Uh, it's 2 p.m. here um, at the Future Transform headquarters. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad to see you all here. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm your host, MC, and cat herder for the day. I'm very glad that you all could make it. Now, to begin, I'd like to introduce you all to the Future Transform, to how it works, how it comes to be. Then we'll introduce our guest and we'll dive right in. So to begin with, please know that the Future Trends Forum is a discussion-based spin-off of the Future Trends in Technology and Education Report. If you haven't seen that before, it's a monthly trends analysis that goes out. It's been covering trends in education and technology for coming up in six years now. If you haven't seen it before, uh, go to ftte.us and you can download a few free copies and check it out. That's a publication. That's a broadcasting-oriented uh, document. Here what we do is discuss, we explore. Now, let's get to the show. Let me introduce you to Liz Willen. Uh, Liz is the editor-in-chief of the Heckinger Report. If you don't know it, it's a fantastic report, a regular publication that gives us information about technology and education in a really up-to-date, clarified, and rich way. I really recommend it. I'm looking forward to talking with Liz about what she sees as the emerging trends in education and technology. Welcome, Liz. Greetings to New York. Thank you, Brian. I'm happy to be here. I'm really glad you could be here. Please tell me how my favorite city in the world is today. It's beautiful, and it's still recovering from the sadness of 9-11. This whole week is just kind of an eerie feeling for many of us who lived through it. Beautiful, yeah. sun, clear sky, and knowing that life could change in an instant as it did that day 16 years ago. I imagine. I imagine. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I have a lot to ask you. A whole bunch of topics. Before we go further, let me ask you, tell us, Liz, what do you do at the Hackinger Report? Uh, you're the editor-in-chief. What am. does that involve now? <laughs> it involves a lot of thinking, talking, and writing about education, but um, be also because we're a nonprofit, we are based here at Teachers College Columbia University, but we are ah. largely by foundations. So um, our existence a lot depends on my ability to raise money and uh, foundation supporting us and we're grateful that they do. Um, we've been in existence for about seven years now. We used to be a training institute to help journalists write about education. There were fewer and fewer journalists around who specialized in education, it seemed at a certain point with all the media cuts. And so we uh, changed our format and our goals and um, went for a new round of fundraising so that we could now work as we do in collaboration with um, hundreds, dozens of media partners all over the country. So you'll see our mm. work on our website, but you may have also told us because you've seen a Heckinger Report story in the New York Times or the Washington Post, or in the AP, or you've heard us on, on public radio. We are in small newspapers in Mississippi, we're in California. So we have a very tiny but hardworking staff of reporters and editors who love the education beat believe it's the most important issue in our country and dedicate themselves to trying to get out there into classrooms and campuses and find out what the main issues are, um, particularly interested in inequality and innovation. Ah, it's important to see that. Thank you for that background. Uh, that explains a great deal. Uh, let me just ask, this has come up a few times in the forum. Uh, are all of your reporters physically co-located there in New York or some of them distributed yep. across no, the country? We have um, our higher education editor, who's fabulous, John Marcus. I highly recommend anyone interested in, in higher education follow John's work. He's based in Boston. We mm. have a reporter based in Oregon. Um, we have a good presence in Mississippi and New Orleans. Nobody is located there 100% at the moment, but we're in and out of those places because we're funded by the Kellogg Foundation. Very uh. interesting there. And we yeah. also have um, a reporter in Oregon and another reporter who we just hired in Boston who's actually writing a newsletter that I urge everyone to sign up for called The Future of Learning. Really looking at innovation, largely in the K-12 space, but about how things are changing in the way we teach and learn, um, partly as a result of technology, partly as a result of new ideas. Excellent. In many ways, it makes you a very 21st century organization, um, yeah. having uh, kind of distributed, non co located uh, personnel. Yeah, you know, what's most important is we're out in classrooms and communities and on campuses, um, really finding out what's happening firsthand. We don't want to be just sitting in an office on the phone. We are just immersed and embedded all over the country in various campuses and classrooms, really, as 
we have a map on the wall of places that we've visited and um, we've really been all over the country and in many cases all over the world. Oh, fantastic. Well, everyone, this is, uh, um, first of all, you should all subscribe to the Hechinger Report and follow them. And second, this is the time to start asking questions and co making comments. Now, I have a couple, actually, I have about 30 questions I'd like to ask, but let okay. me lead off with a couple. Uh, and as you all have questions and comments, please, again, submit them using the, the text chat or the raised hand to join us on stage or just you know, type in your question through the question mark and we're ready to go. The first question I have to ask is, um, we've been talking a lot, well, you and I, but also the Future Transform about financial aid gaps. That is, uh, you know, the 1960s promise of being able to support students through higher education seems to be falling apart in a lot of ways. A few months yeah. ago, we had Professor Sarah Goldrick-Rab on, who gave a detailed, detailed analysis of the many ways that uh, that the 1960s model doesn't really apply to the financial situation of students today. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that. And where do you see some of these challenges and where do you see those headed? Sure, I'm very aware of Sarah's work, um, and she's a great presence on Twitter and in the higher ed conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, what we've been finding in our reporting, and it's it's a really sad but true fact, and that is the rich pool of gap growing wider on American campuses. And um, the reality is, we have more and more wealthy students attending elite, private, and flagship public campuses and the poorer kids, um, because they can't get aid or because they don't do as well on standardized tests, because they don't have the parents and the infrastructure and the communities that push them to the best schools, uh, they end up at community colleges and regional public universities that tend to have lower success rates. So it really holds them back. We see a tremendous inequality and I, I witnessed it firsthand last year by following a class of seniors from um, a charter school in Boston from the beginning of the school year right to the end to see the, where they where they ended up. I went right through the entire college process with six of them. And wow. um, while a couple of them had great success, in many ways the results were somewhat depressing and devastating because it turned out that they were, in many cases, unable to afford their top choices of school. Uh, and they, were, they, were they looking at public and private schools? They were. Um, most of them ended up at public universities, uh, not at the flagships. In one case, um, the, the student got into both, that there was about a $7,000 gap. And the mother, who was a single mother of four, this is the University of Massachusetts Amherst, was going to do everything in her power to have her son go to the flagship university. So she decided to go for it anyway. They were going to give up vacations. She was going to give up meals out. There were, he was going to get an extra job. She was going to take on extra steps as a nurse. So there's a, still a tremendous belief in this country in the power of a top education to be the great equalizer. And she felt that her son would have better opportunities there than at UMass Lowell. And so she was willing to make the sacrifice. I will be checking in with him later this year to see how it's going, um, how he's doing. Is he finishing? Is he getting used to being on campus? Is he adjusting? How are his grades? How is he managing financially? There's a lot of questions and obstacles that are going to be in the way of, of the low-income students in this country. We write about a great deal in our work. Mm. This is a theme that keeps coming up. Do you, uh, do you see this simply increasing, this income gap widening, or do you see any countervailing forces unfolding? We're about to take another um, big dip into the federal data to analyze it, but we definitely see it increasing. And we have learned that students from high income families, they are eight times more likely to get bachelor's degrees by the time they're 24 from those, than those from low income families. And a lot of that has to do with completion rates. Um, mm -hmm. And for that, little, little things we have found can cause a student to drop out, an illness, a death in the family, inability to get home back and forth, uh, rising dorm prices, food prices in the cafeteria, there's all kinds of obstacles. It's sort of like they enter into an obstacle course and what happens to them four years later. Um, we just did a gigantic project in Georgia and we found an inordinate number of students who are not only have dropped out, but then they are unable to pay back their loans and they end up in default. And they're working several jobs in the hopes of getting back to college, but they can't get back until they pay their loans. Right. And they are can't pay their loans. So, you know, these are among the many crises we see by by really being in places where, where we're with families and kids and on campuses and feeling and seeing the struggles firsthand and it's painful. It's uh, it's becoming self-reinforcing too. I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was trying to pull this up right now. 
um, the uh, successor to uh, Arnie Duncan at the uh, Obama administration's Department of Education, John King, uh, referred to higher education as an emerging caste system, um, which I found really astonishing um, and accurate. I was just really impressed that uh, a federal official would say that in public. Um, and uh, it was also a powerful word because it's used to hardening, where we get, as you said, the students who are eight times more likely to graduate are the ones who are more likely to marry each other, get high paying jobs, and then to have their children follow the same route. Whereas the students that you are following are likely to follow completely different social paths. So the yeah, society begins to cleave. Absolutely. Most of them were first in their family. Almost mm -hmm. all of them that I followed were first in their family to go to college. And it's a big deal. You could see their families rejoicing that their kids were getting in. But yeah. we also go back to thinking about what the process, one of the reasons I wanted to follow them all year was just to see what happens if you're a low income student, if your first language isn't English, if your parents mm -hmm. are working or you have a single mom, which almost many of them did, who don't have the ability to understand how complicated our college admissions process is. And there's been so many talk over the years about simplifying the FAFSA, the financial aid forms, and the exams and all of the requirements to get in. But I will tell you that these kids were absolutely drowning in paperwork and unable to keep up. And they were at the kind of high school, it was a charter school that had a lot of extra help and um, they had two guidance counselors, which is a complete luxury at most large public high schools around the country. Um, the ratio can be as low as a thousand to one or 800 to one. So they had right. a lot of they had support, they had many nonprofit groups that were coming in and helping the families with the FAFSA forms and also who could help them translate the language. Despite all this, it was um, one obstacle after another just getting through to get the applications out there. I'm reminded of, um, no, it's quite all right. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, many different responses, but one just to mention quickly and then I wanna, um, is, uh, Tressie Cottom in her book on for-profit education mentions that one of the strengths for-profits had was their ability to um, have a simple, easy intake process. And they made that a point that it was really easy to apply. Um, and that's definitely got to be an advantage. Friends, before I, I go further, because I have another question that's a follow-up, let me just remind you that uh, please ask a question, uh, make a comment using uh, any of those channels that I had mentioned before. Um, the related question or follow-up question is about student debt. I mean, in our lifetimes, Lizzie and I, we've seen the student debt balloon from a, a rounding error to being more than a trillion dollars. And that's how we finance higher education in many ways. Um, where do you see that going? Do you, do you see any change in that? Or are we simply going to keep financializing the cost of higher education? Well, there's a couple of things. There's some initiatives now around free college and free community college that some states are trying, which could potentially mm -hmm. But I think we're entering a sort of a mysterious space now because we have a new Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, who has not made a clear attempt to explain to us what her agenda is around this. Um, there's a lot of fear that she is going to let some of the for-profit institutions who have been among the worst offenders for helping students rack up debts and not uh, be able to get jobs to be able to pay them back um, off the hook by, by rolling back some of the regulations of the Obama era. So that that is a very big problem. On the plus side and the positive side are some of these movements towards free colleges, which however often don't help a bunch of students in the middle brackets or um, in the lower middle classes. So um, there's initiatives, but I think we're in a, a really difficult spot. Um, and again, I started off by saying education is supposed to be the great leveler. And without, mm -hmm. with the kind of um, debt students are facing, you don't um, have those opportunities. There's some work colleges now, like Warren Wilson in North Carolina. They're doing some mm -hmm. really interesting things. We just sent a reporter down there and, and saw that these are programs where students get credit for working and have a reduced um, tuition load as a result. Um, and that's very helpful. But I also think that we have to remember, and it's so often forgotten in this debate over higher education is that the typical college student is nowhere near uh, the, you know, the, the four year, the student going to the elite four year schools that gets so much press and attention. I mean, the majority right. Right. go to community colleges, uh, they're mm -hmm. older, they may be veterans. So, um, mm -hmm. Also been writing about and looking at and thinking a lot about are some of the different pathways to getting 
credentials um, to getting a higher to getting a degree, which may not look like a typical four-year college degree, but nonetheless may uh, help this population uh, get to into the workforce. Really, competency-based education. Yeah, I'm sorry. What, ba basic education. Sorry, I just started. Started. I just started. I just started. I'm talking about. Um, different ways of education like trades and reviving vocational ed for example like california is spending six million dollars on a campaign to revive the reputation of vocational ed and improve yeah. the way it's delivered because we are there have been so much effort about pushing college for all that was a big obama initiative mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's now a lot of fields that face worker, worker shortages as a result. So what I'm saying is there are lots of other ways to get an education besides going to a traditional four-year school that will um, lead to enormous amounts of debt and the problem that we were originally talking about. Yeah, a lot of trades. Um, and um, I was asking, sorry, I had a weird audio glitch in my end. I, I was asking if you saw competency-based education systems as part of that. Where adults absolutely. Could get some credit. absolutely that's one of the trends that we see and we're um writing about a great deal and i've seen it by talking to a lot of veterans who are coming back um to campuses mm -hmm. and trying to get their credentials and then trying to get the competencies that they learned in the military um earned towards count towards their college degree so yes there's a lot of a growing movement around credentials, around um, gaining new skills. There's also something called stackable credentials. It's not a term you would use in conversation, but it really is about, there's lots of pushes and ways to get more Americans to a college degree. As I said, it was a huge initiative under the Obama administration um, to have more degrees and certificates and um, higher education. And we are not seeing that same priority being set by the current administration. So there's a lot of curiosity about what will happen. Oh, that's interesting. I think we have a, a, a person who wants to come up on stage and join us, I think, in a minute, we we'll give her a shot. But um, oh, that's interesting because we had the, the 1990s, we had the push from the first Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and then following that, the second Bush administration and Obama to increase more and more college enrollment. and. Um, in, in 2012, I published a piece of what I call peak higher ed. It was almost a satirical idea that maybe we've reached a kind of peak of enrollment and now we're sliding down. Um, and it seems to be the case uh, where the total number of students enrolled has actually been dipping down. Uh, well, that is absolutely true. There is an enrollment decline um, and it's been dropping. The National Student Clearinghouse has it dropping for the last five years. Um, and that means that there's 81,000 fewer high school graduates nationwide. So while you're seeing that trend play out and four-year colleges are plenty worried, particularly in the Midwest, mm -hmm. the other that I'm talking about is where a lot of attention needs to be paid. Now we're talking older students, veterans, community college students, people who have not been able to go to school for a few years, went to the workforce and now want to get on a higher, get on a higher education track. So I think that's where a lot of the energy and attention is going to be. And I think that's where we're going to be focusing a lot of our reporting on in the, in the months to come. Good. Now we need to see that um, because that's what you're describing is the majority, if not the super majority of higher education experience in the U.S. Right. But the, you'll see what's represented in a lot of the coverage is a great mm -hmm. deal of just how hard it is to get into Harvard and the elite four-year-old schools every year. And, and it's just such a small percentage of the population and the need in this country. Well, it's totally not representative. In fact, there was a, a book from a Stanford University uh, dean a few months ago where she was speaking about students today, and she was using the Stanford student population as the example. I thought, this is terrible. I mean, this has nothing to do with a typical student of the United States. Um, yep. But here, let's see. I think we've got Vicki, who's coming to us from Oregon. Vicki, can you hear us? Hi, yes, and I am coming from Iowa now. Iowa, that's right. Hello, yes. hello. Good, good to see you. Hi. Um, just it, it, if there's any data in um, coming from Oregon that was a free community college arena, what, what mm -hmm. states are doing that free well? I, I hear free, and the first thing I think is eh, it's 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 free-ish, right? It's maybe free tuition, but not fees, maybe not textbooks. But wh wh where's some of that coming out that there's been some success with that? Um, and I'm in community college now, so I'm really interested to hear, hear if there's any success stories yet. 
That's a really good question. I, 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 Brian, you may know more than I do, but a lot of this is so new. I mean, in many cases, these have just been announced. So I don't think there's data available yet, but I think we'll be definitely be following it and okay. we'll, we'll want to know. And it's, it's been, there's, it's controversial. There's still a lot of arguments yeah. about it in a lot of states, but um, I think that's a, it's a great question. And I think that we'll hopefully be able to find the answers, but might take a few okay. years. The data won't be available just yet. Okay. The, uh, the only day that I've heard is um, that uh, Oregon had a strange funding glitch where something like 80% <laughs> of their fund actually got funded. Um, and uh, so th there were, I, they're using the number four out of five to describe the number of students who actually get funded. Um, okay. Several cities have been doing this. Um, uh, Boston just announced a program. And uh, Rhode Island, which is not a very big state, but uh, they have a program as well. Um, okay. Thank you for asking that, Vicky. This is uh, um, something that we really have to keep an eye out for. Um, yeah. Well, please stick around. Don't 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 go away. Okay. Stay on stay on stage for now, um, because I wanted to uh, turn um, to the question of uh, solutions or strategies. Um, Liz, uh, John Marcus published a great piece that I've been showing people for months now. Uh, about the different ways that uh, universities and colleges have been trying to stop the enrollment decline. Uh, yeah. And you talked about Ohio Wesleyan, and you talked with uh, my good friend, uh, Cappy Hill, uh, and you found a lot of different uh, answers and suggestions. And I'm just wondering if you just quickly throw out, what are some of the solutions that institutions have been doing that to you that seem at least workable? Sure, that was, a, that was a great example of um, a university um, really drilling down and saying, what can we do to make our campus more attractive? Generally, when a campus says, when a college says that, they, they end up saying, well, we need to spend more money or we need to light the pathways and have um, one of the schools that I was following once gave Segway tours. <laughs> you know, they, they, there's a lot of competition for students at, at some of these types of liberal arts schools, not the real top tier, but also mm -hmm. excellent schools, but that mm -hmm. may not have as many applicants. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, they started really thinking about what kinds of programs would attract students, how to get more, um, what, what was it, a, did they need to add a sports team? Did they need to add a science center? I, I, I don't know if you can put the story up, but I highly recommend it, or I can, uh, I can put it up in the chat box later, but it, it's filled with how one university did a lot of soul searching and and studies and came up with some solutions and they're really finding some success. I think that they're going to need to be worried because as you pointed out earlier, Brian, there was a survey today of admissions directors. Um, it, it appeared in Inside Higher Ed. Um, just 34% are meeting their enrollment targets this year and last year it was 37. And be, um, so it's, it's getting worrisome for schools like yes. that and they have to make a huge effort to keep students up. Um, they also are usually anxious to have as many high paying and international, full pay and international students as they can. Great competition for those students as well. And there's concern that with this change in demographic that these schools uh, won't be able to be as attractive and, and, and get the students they need to stay open. As you also have uh, seen in some of your stories, some schools have closed or are merging or working together, right. I, I'm afraid you're gonna see a lot more of this and going to need to see more solutions. And we um, we work with something called the Solutions Journalism Network. So if, if any folks mm. out there have ideas or can tell us about things that are working in this area, we'll come visit, we'd love to know. You hear that everybody? That's a great invitation. Uh, so we can send somebody out. Um, Vicki, we're gonna need to clear some space to have more people come yes. up, so thank you. We'll bug you in a minute. Um, the uh, Let's see, I think we have a couple of text questions. Uh, Christopher, if you could flash one on the screen. And while that's coming, uh, in the chat box, Mark Corbett Wilson, always, always helpful, mentions that uh, the City College of San Francisco has a free year tuition offer. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman Cohen asks, as an ed journalist, how do you bridge the divide between stories that may play to an ed audience? Oh, can you bring it back up again, Chris? Right. Between stories that may play to an ed audience, policy, local stories, et cetera, and the general audience who sees ed as part of a national larger issue. Oh, that's you a know, great question. that is such a great question. And I might feel a little bit stupid about it now because for many, many years, I was a journalist working at a mainstream news organization. I worked at New York Newsday for many years covering New York City Public wow. Schools. And I was an education journalist at Bloomberg News. In both cases, we had education had to compete with lots and lots of other issues. And you had to fight to get them 
you know, out front, although the different publications had different um, reasons to be interested in it. At Bloomberg, it was largely interested in college admissions and endowment and um, other ways that colleges could uh, be involved for, could be helpful to a very wealthy audience. Whereas at New York News, I was writing about the nation's largest um, public school system and all the problems inherent in that. So now I'm in this little bubble, the Heckinger Report. All of us are committed and passionate to covering education. We think it is the best beat on earth. And we are so delighted to have our own page, our own Heckinger Report, where we, we really get to be experts in this area and, and, and try and write it in ways that all kinds of people will find it interesting and important. We absolutely have always felt that it's the most important topic. Um, in a democratic society, what could be more important? This last election, if anything didn't tell, told us how much we need to have um, better education in all parts of the country, there's still so much misunderstanding and misconception of what happens both in government and on a daily basis. I, I can think of no more important issues. So I'm in this happy little bubble where we don't have to worry about you know, competing with the business section and the, we don't have to put any celebrities or um, viral cat videos up to, to get attention. However, it's very important that we have lots and lots of engaged readers and listeners like all of you today. Um, if I was gonna be up here talking about Angelique Jolie's new film or her the dissipation of her marriage with uh, Brad Pat Pitt, this audience would have been sadly much, much larger. Now that bothers me. <laughs> Well, it could, uh, you know, that's how, how do we do it? We have to be, uh, this discovery about student credential transfers may surprise you, right? We have to. Yeah, we try and make it clear that we do not think education is boring. We try and write it in ways that are entertaining, that are engaging, and mostly that are about the the stakeholders and the, ch and the people who are involved. In, you know, if, if any way we can get, a, grow our audience and have more interest in it, is a fantastic um, thing. I mean, there's some great interest in our site, but the bulk of our readers come from reading our stories in other publications where they didn't just go there because they wanted to read a Heckinger education story. They, they may want to know a lot of other things as well. Norma, it's a fantastic question. And a, a really, really Thank rich you. answer. Uh, speaking of great questions, we have a video question from Patrice Prusco. Uh, let's see if we can beam him up on stage. Her, I'm sorry, Patrice, I'm sorry. I was thinking France. Welcome, Patrice. Can you hear us? Ah, uh, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Beautifully, beautifully. Great. Welcome. Um, not a problem. Patrice is a male name in uh, in France. <laughs> so you you know you talked a bit about the uh, obstacles that students face that results in them not having academic success, and a little bit about the solutions. And I was wondering. I've been trying to think of it rather than you know, talking about per persistence and completion and retention, just really thinking about how we create a culture and a community where all students can thrive. And by thrive, you know, not just be involved academically, but thinking about how can they be involved socially and environmentally. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, you know, how can we kind of shift um, and move the needle a little bit so that, you know, more of our students are thriving in a college community? I think that's a great question as well. And I'm gonna answer that one probably in the context of the more traditional four-year schools that we're talking about, because those are places where low-income students might feel more out of place. And a, a great example, and I hate to go back to the Ivy Leagues, but one of the students that I was following last year in this charter school um, ended up choosing Dartmouth, but he was so worried about what would happen to him there. For example, he spent a lot of time walking around Hanover wondering where he could get a haircut because he's from the Dominican Republic and he has you know, this kinky hair and it's really important to him to have a good haircut. And he felt like he was suddenly surrounded by all white people. And he wondered, he was reading in their chat room and they were talking about you know, elite sports that he had never done or taken part of. He wasn't even sure where New Hampshire was. He had never been there. So mm -hmm. he was one of the big questions for a student, a low income student going to a student, uh, going to a school like that is, what kind of support will I have? How will I get help if I'm having a problem? Will there be anyone to turn to? Will I feel left out as a minority? And I think mm -hmm. colleges in many cases are recognizing that they, if they want to have higher retention rates, particularly for minorities who do tend to have lower rates of retention, mm -hmm. 
those from low income backgrounds as well, that they need to put a lot of supports in place. Um, and you're seeing that more and more. We went to an orientation at Smith College a few years ago. They, they had a whole separate orientation just for first generation students. Uh, first generation college students. And the president at that time was a first generation college student herself. And she spent time talking to these students and saying, you know, you can you can feel comfortable here. You belong here. So there's a lot of cultural areas, cultural things that needed to be bridged as well uh, to make this happen and to make some students feel comfortable. But I do think um, more colleges are starting to recognize that extra support um, must go to not just academic, but but socially and otherwise must go to must go to students who haven't had the kind of uh, family background that would make them easily feel comfortable mm -hmm. going away to school. All right, thank you. That's a great question, um, and it reminds me that a lot of the expenses involved in having those kind of uh, strategies in place are often called administrative. So when we speak of administrative bloat, we partly mean growing the resources necessary to keep students uh, so that they can feel more welcome and uh, and more engaged right. and they have to feel welcome there in the first place and one way they feel welcome is by getting um you know a generous financial aid package that makes it possible for them to go in the first place you can't give them this you have to get them to campus first and then keep them there so we have the so-called administrative bloat as part of that and then we also have the increased financial aid which means the discount rates gets to go up get go up and that's uh uh, you can see how this becomes really, really, uh, well, really listen, exciting. it's the only way that most, it's the only revenue that most colleges have for, you know, how to bring in. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it becomes that double-edged sword issue. Well, you find that yeah. in many cases the financial aid doesn't cover textbooks and living expenses, travel, you know, the ability to participate yes, in some of these yes, activities. Yes, yes, absolutely. There's no question. I mean, bus fare home, you know, mm -hmm. this kid was really worried about he, the, the, the bus that he was taking back and forth between Dartmouth and Boston wasn't, was, was expensive and he was worried about how he was going to get back and forth a couple of times. So yeah, all of those things are, are a huge issue and a lot, you know, a lot of students are working and that's adds an extra burden on top of worrying about fitting in and feeling supported, you know, they need to raise money for the books and for all of those extras. And that means having a job on campus in addition to having, um, you know, a substantial academic load. And some of that money then goes back to support their families as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a very different situation. A welcome Heather, Heather Wetzler. Do I have that right? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Hi. I was wondering, um, I mean, a good resource, it's less of a question, but Posse, Specifically, are you familiar with Posse? I am. Yeah, Posse has had enormous success in getting probably one of the most successful um, vehicles for getting more low-income low students on campus um, because these students go go to school in groups. They stay in their cohort and they support each other. Um, and yeah, it's growing too as well. But um, it's one of those small initiatives that's had great success, but it doesn't solve the problem in a large-scale way. At the same time, you know. It's probably helped thousands of students over the years and gotten them through, through schools where they would not normally either feel comfortable or engaged. That gives them a lot of resources and support all the way through from high school, first towards getting in, and then it sticks with them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was my only comment, just because I was really impressed by the work that they were doing. And I knew, I, I'm pretty sure they actually came about because um, a child from a, like, a socioeconomic um background like lower socioeconomic went to princeton and he dro ended up dropping out and when people asked why did he drop out and he said i didn't have my posse right and kind of along the lines mm. of what you were saying is that mm. he didn't, he didn't feel comfortable and you know it could be like where to get his haircut or you know at princeton like the kids there are like oh my god i'm not going to be able to go to aspen you know or that's like right. the biggest issue and he's more worried about like if he's going to be able to eat or you know to your point of course, right. it's a whole reality check and, and i found that i actually talked to some policy students and one was they were helping a student who was going to bowden and they were warning mm -hmm. her that when she showed up which it's, it's a beautiful campus in maine that they were mm -hmm. going to all of the students with this gigantic lobster dinner she had never seen a lobster before and they were letting her know like how do you, you know, what to crack it how do you hold it not to just sit, sit there and say, I need my knife and fork. <laughs> but I mean, it's a, it's a cultural, 
issue. And but the posse was there giving more advice about that, about how to handle the dorms, um, um, about how to handle a roommate who maybe wanted to have a maid, which has happened, or had their laundry service done when they're you know she's worrying about the bus ride home. So, you know, again. It, Talk about education as the great leveler, but there's such inequality from the minute you step on an elite campus like that. But I will also, again, go back to what I said initially. That is it's a very small percentage of students that we're talking about. Right, right. School. right. Just a quick question, Heather or Liz, do you uh, know any of the leaders of uh, Posse that um, uh, you'd recommend that we should bring as guests for the forum? Um, I know someone who's on the board of directors that I could reach out to and probably get a name for you. Heather, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm happy to come and talk about the program. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, well, it's really great to have a nice solution uh, in play that we can talk about. Um, and I'm thank you again, Heather, for bringing that up. Uh, we have more questions, more questions that are coming in. So let's flash one of them on the screen. Let's see, we have one from Gordon Dalby. And Gordon, if I mispronounce your name, please forgive me. Uh, Gordon asks, if you could conjecture on the potential impact of Purdue University buying Kaplan, is that a threat or an opportunity? Oh, I, think, I wish I knew more about that to be more specific. I would say the answer is most likely going to be a little bit of, of both. But, I mean, you're going to see these sort of bold moves in universities that are try, trying different things. Like they may be looking at us as an opportunity or as innovation. But I don't know enough about the specific and what's going to happen there to, to be able to give you a cogent answer. Do you? have any, Can you tell us a little bit more about what, what your thinking is on it so far? Yeah, Gordon, if you want to either uh, join us in video or if you'd like to uh, type in something in the uh, text box, we'd uh, love to hear more of your thinking about this. Uh, ah, you don't have a camera. But if you want to uh, give us more text, either uh, by another you know text question like that or through the discussion box, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear more. Uh, this is uh, quite an experiment. It's uh, I think, this hurt me if I'm wrong, but I think this is unique. Uh, I haven't heard anybody else doing this. Yeah, I mean, it's in the sixth year right now. So again, we, we really don't know um, what is going to happen to it, uh, what, what, where it's going to be eventually. But, you know, it's again, it's about reaching, a lot of it is about reaching those same non-traditional students that I was um, talking to you a little bit about earlier. Exactly, exactly. And we're going to stop saying non-traditional at some point, just say students. Local students in this country, not the yeah. Bodens and students in the dark midst of this world. Well, speaking of students, we have a wonderful question from the wonderful Roxanne Riskin, uh, who asks, can you reflect upon the recent Jill Barshay's article on community college students taking more credits than needed? Is this a new discovery? And what do you see as remediation? Well, okay, first of all, I'm going to say the word remediation is a strange word to use only because one of the biggest issues that every community college I've visited and written about is, is remediation, is remedial math and how these kids get stuck in it and don't come out. It's been a huge obstacle to uh, graduation. So Jill really found some research that um, was new that we're all, that nobody realized um, exactly what it, what it might mean because it was sort of counterintuitive. And so I'm I'm not sure when you say is it what do I see as remediations where what exactly you meant by that question. Let me try and ask you to explain that a little bit more. Yeah, Roxanne, if your if your camera is up, especially if your puppy is nearby, I'd love to have you uh, join us on stage. Um, and for the rest of you, if you'd like to join us, um, um, please again we're uh, we're coming towards the end of the hour. So you want to get your question before it's too late. Hello, Roxanne. Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, I don't see your puppy. How can we let you speak without the puppy? It's nap time. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, that's allowed. That's allowed. It, it is. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, my question is from Jill's wonderful article is, if so many students or whatever the number might be, it sounds like it was an uh, enormous number for her to write that article of over... Um, loading students with credits and community college that are irrelevant to their field of study. What do you see as being helpful to it's stop this? <laughs> I mean, we had um, somebody who runs the community college research center nearby here called it an epidemic. And, um, and that is because mm. there's a real problem with this. And that is that you go to community college theoretically to save money. It's so right. much. Exactly. Right. 
And so to take to have to take more courses than you need, and there's going to be a paper coming out of it next month. So Excellent. I think a lot of the details we don't know yet, but that's just going to end up costing so much money. If they take an extra 12 to 15 credits, that's thousands of dollars in extra tuition. So I think you will see, I think it's new because it's just being released. It's done by the Community College Research Center, which is nearby here at Teachers College. And I think once that paper comes out and the results are widely disseminated and discussed, you might see some real discussion and potential action. When I left community college, my students, I was an adjunct English professor many years ago, and also I was the coordinator of learning disability services in Connecticut anyway. My students only were focused on taking the courses they needed to, and I, right. and I was um, their academic advisor, and not many would ask to particularly take extra courses. They were focused right. on their, their concentration on their area that right. and no, of their area of study. That's right. And one reason, one solution we have been seeing towards this, and a lot of foundations are supporting it, is something called guided pathways. And that's where students actually do have a plan. They're going to take this course in this sequence, and you're going to be guided towards what you need to get to graduation. Yes. And it's an idea that makes an enormous amount of sense when you when you see something like this with students loading up on courses that they may not need and maybe can't afford. It, it, it's it's really problematic. And do you have any of uh, uh, any thoughts of because of that phenomenon that you call it, are students leaving the community college or dropping out? They just well, have a footprint to get into community college because they may have not been able to afford a four-year college. And then we're putting up a barrier, an anstalang, a roadblock, once they get into community colleges and overload them with more courses. It makes no sense. It's one reason why you're seeing more of these pathways that I spoke about earlier. But, but again, I'm going to go back to that other question. Community college dropout rates have always been really depressing, really horrendous, whether it is because of this or if this is a contributing factor. Part of it is because people are working. Part of it is the remedial courses. Um, part of it is the very nature of the eight you're coming in when you're working and you have maybe you're supporting a family and all that. But um, efforts to improve community college retention rates and graduation ra rates have been going on for years with with varied levels of success. But I think one thing you're seeing, and we'll, we can talk about this another time, but these new ways that community colleges are teaming up to help students get actual certificates, trades, and skills that they need to get jobs, that will keep, that will definitely be an incentive to keep um, people in the schools because there's really becoming, we have a shortage of skilled workers. And if they can work with industry and, and make sure that people get degrees and get to these jobs, it will be a big help. Thank you. Oh, I just great. signed up. I just signed up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. It's an excellent article. Thank you. Well, this is one of the reasons I wanted to have Liz on board um, today is because there's such good stuff coming from Hacking Tree. Um, I, I have to say, uh, let me remind everybody, uh, we've got about uh, 12 minutes to go. So if you would like to ask questions, uh, this is your opportunity. Again, uh, using the uh, chat box, which some of you have been all over, uh, or using the uh, raised hand button. Now, if you'd like, just, let's see, on my screen to the right edge, there should be a weird kind of teal colored box that says join podium. So if you just click that, you should teleport right there to the screen. So that's even easier. Um, uh, Mark Corbett Wilson, Liz, uh, he offers a really typically penetrating insight. He says, as to plotting a course of study and then staying on it, Community college students are largely on their own. Student advisor ratios in the two sector can be abysmal in many schools. They can run as high as 1,500 to one. That's right. Mark is absolutely right. And uh, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a huge problem. There's no mm -hmm. question. And that's, again, these guided pathways that we've just been starting to write about are, mm -hmm. um, are one potential solution to this. But yeah, they're, they, and uh, they're, again, it's the other things that we were talking about earlier, lack of counselors, juggling jobs. There have been a couple of other efforts that have sort of helped, and I guess it's similar to the to the posse idea. Um, I visited a community college in Brooklyn that was doing a, a lot of having grouping the students and, and having them study together, it's study groups and work study groups where they really um, supported one another. And that kind of thing helps as well, because if you don't have the counselors, so just giving them support group because they're kind of on the uh, large largely as you said mark college community college students can be on their on their own and and they're not living in dorms they're not on sports teams in a lot of cases they don't have that that built-in group 
No, that's a that's really really important. Again, you know, thinking of inequality, we can see really two different levels of higher education available. Um, Liz, I, I want to ask a, a related but fairly different question. Um, and again, I remind everybody else to not let me hog the podium because uh, this is a this is a rare opportunity to get to talk with Liz. Uh, question about gender. Um, you have a fantastic article about the vanishing species known as the college male, uh, and this is. I do because the there's a historical switch happening where the majority of undergraduates uh, and I believe the majority of graduate students now are women and this is across the board across all states and the majority is pretty high it's only like 55 percent to 45 uh, percent you mentioned before that some colleges are looking at building up more sports teams and major reason for that is not to make money because they won't but to attract more male students if you could speak to that um, What's happening? Are we seeing higher education become feminized? Are we seeing a historical revolution? Where is this going? I have to say, this is one of my this is one of my favorite stories that um, John did this year, and mostly because he he was walking along a campus and it was um, in, it was Carlo University, and it was and he was um, pointing out somebody was talking about this problem. They were in the lobby of the student center, and 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 they pointed to a man, and they were like, "There's one! There's one!" Oh, um, <laughs> has more than 56% of students on campuses nationwide now. 56%. That's the education data. And there's some 2.2 million fewer men than women will be enrolled, enrolled in college this year. And there, that trend shows no sign of abating. 57% um, will probably be women by 2026. So men are now the new minority on campus. And um, that's started that's something that a lot of colleges are are realizing they're going to have to do something about in terms of marketing in terms of you know, maybe possibly sports teams um it's also in terms of informs really what happens in high schools too uh about keeping them in now on the other side I'm looking at this issue all last year under an obama initiative to get more um males of color on campus and mm -hmm. that was that he had been pushing for a long time. That's another initiative we're gonna see fizzle out under um, on this next, it's certainly not gonna be a priority under this next administration. So for a long time, there was tension, and under the last administration, there was a tension on fixing this area for young men, for, for black men largely and Hispanic men. And now we're realizing that colleges are finally saying, wow, there's just like a lack of guys. You gotta do something about it. Oh, oh, oh. It just, you just gave me this quick flash, which is the possibility that, say, four years from now, we might have um, the uh, more and more men encouraged to not go to college, but instead to go uh, work in trades uh, or in the military, um, and more and more women go to higher education, where, I mean, this this may be a really strong bifurcation of, uh, of the workforce and education. Yeah, and um, it uh, also tells you that we it's not surprising there was a pew survey that i read recently that um there's not a lot of faith in the higher education system in this country not, there's an overwhelming majority that found it that higher education isn't useful so there is a big uh, marketing problem that colleges are going to have to have to ha help people understand that there's enough of a payoff that the that the mm -hmm. debt that mm -hmm. about and that, that there is, is not going to be insurmountable, that there will be viable jobs, that the experience is worthwhile. So there's uh, a lot of work that has to be done, not just for men. Well, a, f a few weeks ago, we had um, uh, Professor Chris Newfield, uh, who has a series of books about the changing nature of public financing or public higher education. And he was making a similar argument that we need to uh, basically reboot the popular understanding of higher education. And for him, a key part was seeing that we think, rethink of higher education as a public good rather than a private one. Right. Do, you, do you think that's possible? And, or was this like a generation long shift that will have to happen? To rethink it as a, a to, uh, to public understand. Good. Well, the problem is it's a public, the public, if we're talking about the public universities, one big crisis that they've had in many years is uh, during the economic uh, crisis a few years back, states really cut their budgets a mm -hmm. lot. So their uh, their ability to what they can offer um, was was in a great um, problem for them. That really big cuts, and they haven't re they haven't recovered 
And so what you haven't said is that states, as well as the federal government, have been shifting financial aid away from lower income to higher income students. So now we have this where, you know, spending the most on those who need the most help, the least on those who um, arguably need the least. So, you know, that's yeah. why one of the many reasons I think you're having a questioning of the idea of it as a, a public good. And, and I, I do think a lot of this goes back to the pu uh, cutback on public universities. And if any of you here are coming from a public university, you have certainly can talk about ways or have had examples of ways where um, the, the cuts have been pretty deep. Uh, we have um, a, uh, a note from Mark uh, Corbett Wilson on the chat box. And Mark's uh, camera I can't bring him on, or else I definitely have him on. Where he uh, he argued that it wasn't just the, the gender shift wasn't just happening with students, but also that uh, faculty, staff, and administration um, are also becoming uh, uh, more and more female. In which case, that sounds kind of like K through twelve in a way um, as well. That this sounds is, like story we'll have to go investigate. <laughs> I haven't seen the figures um, on that, but that's interesting. Uh, Mark is someone uh, who's, who's well worth their time, one of the people I'm very, very proud of having in the forum community. Uh, speaking of forum community, friends, I, I have time for one more question from me, um, but this is your last shot if you guys would like to ask one more question for yourself. Well, while you do that, while you think hard, I'm going to ask a question, which is, where do you think online learning is heading in this in this universe? And I, I mean entirely online learning, not blended learning, not campus learning, but what we used to call distance learning. I mean, do you think that we will see distance learning becoming a viable alternative to, say, for profits and community colleges and face-to-face -face environment? Uh, do you see distance learning offering uh, an alternative for addressing uh, inequality? Where, where do you think that's headed? Well, I want to bring up one interesting thing that happened around distance learning. I don't know if you saw this, but there was a professor who uh, last year told everybody and um, that his students think they, they could learn remotely. And this year, he said, "Nope, you all got to come to class." Yeah. Uh, so there uh. is a, a, a shift in that, and then the, you know there was a great deal of excitement at first with edX and all of these ways, um, and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, for people with busy lives. Um, and you can earn degrees elsewhere. But I think there's a lot of work to be done. It got caught up in some of the schools and there's been problems with the technology. I think there's a lot that will um, emerge and change with this. I think it's really constantly. Um, and I, I, I'm not sure I'm capable of telling you what, the what I predict the future trend is, but I think as long as we have the technology, there will be lots of interest in it, getting it right, having it work, making it accessible, um, is a lot of that is a work in progress. This feels in many ways like we're in a transitional stage, um, where you know, the great higher education settlement of the 1960s is becoming something very, very different, and we're still grasping well, at the edges of it. That's right, but we've also found that while the Enrollment, at least in our most recent stories, um, number of, of students enrolling in online courses is rising, but a little bit of uh, a lack of enthusiasm has emerged because we looked at a study uh, from some university leaders and 63% of chief academic officers consider MOOCs, massive open online courses. While they were critical to their long-term strategies, the number had dropped considerably from the near year before and 29 percent said the outcomes were inferior mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said there's a lot of work to be done um only 29 percent of academic leaders faculty accept the value and legitimacy of online courses so it's very much emerging with a lot of skepticism and a lot of questions a lot of questions and uh, i i want to thank you Liz, for answering so many of our questions, because we are, I'm afraid, at the end of the hour. Um, we only have an hour for our forum, uh, and you've been fantastic. You're a seminar yeah. leader in education. I, I really have a lot of questions about education, which is why I'm running the Heckinger Report, and I hope all of you will read it, because we bring it to you every day. It's free, you can sign up, and um, we really are trying to answer many of those questions through, through real on the ground reporting that Brian brought up today. I, I appreciate having all of you here. And they really do. If you haven't seen this on the right edge of the screen, 
uh, you'll see two um, uh, orange colored shapes. One with a big H, which is for the home page of the Eggenger Report, and below that is a sign up for their newsletter. So I encourage you all to click on both of those. Um, and in the meantime, let me just thank you one more time. I have to wrap up with pointers for next week, um, but um, thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you another time. Appreciate it. Uh, so we have uh, every week we have a different guest every week we have a different topic every week a new conversation and we carry themes forward so next week uh we shift towards more towards technology with the splendid jennifer goldbeck uh jennifer is a professor at the university of maryland where she works in the human computer interaction lab and among other things she's an expert in security with some very very controversial ideas about how to improve security uh both on campus for digital security and also in the world. And I think in a season where we have the spectacular Equifax hack, which I've called the Equifax fiasco, I think there's no other better person that we can talk to than Jennifer Goldbeck. So please come back next week, next Thursday for that. Now, if you'd like to learn more uh, about the Future Trends Forum, go to ftte.us to learn more about the uh, FTE report. If you'd like to learn more about this technology, go to shinding.com. And otherwise, we'll see you next week and we'll see you online. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye.